So I would like to welcome everyone to the 17th AG2PI workshop. Um, AG2PI's mission is to create a shared vision across the crop and livestock research communities. Today's speakers, Dr. Bresselin, uh, Doria, and PhD candidate, Mr. Ferraria, embody this vision. They will presenting the computational system developed by their highly interdisciplinary team supported by AG2PI's seed grant program. These researchers span multiple disciplines, including electrical and computer engineering, computer science, computer vision, statistics, computational biology, precision agriculture, and farming management decision making. Together, they represent and embody everything that AG2PI is trying to create. Uh, today, they're going to demonstrate their easy-to-use and web-based system for computer vision and model training for the classification of image features using neural networks. Of note, I also want to mention that AG2PI has a new round of, of grant funding. This time it's called Coconut Grants, representing larger funding amounts up to $250,000. Information on this program can be found on the AG2PI website, and I will be posting a link straight to the program in a moment. The one thing that I do want to mention is for anyone who is interested in those uh, submitting a proposal is that the due date for those is January 6, 2023. And with that, it is my great pleasure to hand this over to this phenomenal team. Um, please take it away. Thanks so much, Eric, for the kind introduction. So I'll share my screen here real quick. And before I start the presentation, I'd like to uh, submit a All right, so I see that most uh, participants answered it already. Uh, so thanks very much for, for inputs. And with that, I'd like to, let me close the window here. Yeah, with that, I'd like to start the presentation. And so as uh, Eric mentioned, I'm, a, I'm Rafael Ferreira. I'm a PhD student in the Department of Animal and Dairy Sciences at University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I work with uh, Dr. Doria in his lab. And in, today, I, I'd like to talk with you about the tool that we've been developing with a seed grant from AG2PI called Train Your Network. So the idea of this tool is to simplify uh, the development of computer vision applications for users that are not necessarily experts in programming. So first of all, I'd like to just give a quick introduction of our team. So there's Dr. Joan Doria, Dr. Thiago Brizolin, and I, Rafael Ferreira. We are the three co-PIs of this project. I'm a PhD student, and Dr. Brizolin and Dr. Doria are assistant professors. And I'd like also to acknowledge uh, Dr. Jose Clayton, which is a, was a collaborator in this project uh, while he was doing his postdoc with Dr. Doria. So um, I'd really like to thank AG2PI and USDA for this uh, opportunity of uh, funding this project and presenting it here. Um, and as a quick, um, just a quick side note, I'd like to say that all of us are either animal scientists or computer engineers. So uh, most of the examples that I'm going to give through all this presentation are re more related to livestock. I tried to talk a little bit about crop science, but I I'd like to say sorry in advance if uh, most of the examples are in livestock and they're not necessarily related to um, your field of study. But, uh, so, okay, so with that, uh, the outline of today's presentation, I'd like to talk about applications of computer vision in agriculture and why it has a big potential and importance. Then I'm gonna go through some fundamentals of computer vision and some basics and theoretical basics which are going to hopefully help you understand how the tool that we've been developing works uh, behind the scenes and why it's important to have a tool that facilitates things for non-expert users. Then I'm going to talk about how you, what usually you can do to train or your own convolution neural network. And I'm going to, of course, explain what a convolution neural network is later in the presentation. 
And uh, I'm going to mention some uh, democratization initiatives to make life easier for people who want to train their own networks and then present our own um, um, our own platform that we've been developing and give a quick demo of how it works the way it is now. So first of all, AI in agriculture has a huge potential uh, to be applied in farms and help monitor all the parameters that are available in the farm and help both farmers, consultants, and um, everyone related in the industry. So in this picture, we have all those different variables that interact with each other, and we can use sensors to monitor them. So if we look at the animal side, we could monitor variables such as the animal behaviors, what they're doing, uh, the body weight of the animals in real time, milk yield, disease incidence, and all that. Uh, with crop, I have fewer examples because, uh, as I mentioned, I'm not in the crop science area, but I know uh, it's important to monitor traits such as crop yield, the health status, um, soil quality, and so on. And all those variables can usually be monitored through the use of sensors in an automated way. So uh, you don't need someone manually collecting all this data in the farm. You can install sensors, different types of sensors in your farm and collect this data automatically with little human input. And today I'd like to focus on the cameras because cameras allow for the use of computer vision. Uh, computer vision is defined as the field of study that um, uh, researches how computers can understand digital images and videos. And I'm going to go into a little bit more uh, specifically how that works later, but I'd like to first give a quick motivation of why we choose to focus on computer vision. Uh, first of all, cameras are relatively inexpensive nowadays, and they are pretty easy to install. So you can install cameras in a farm, leave it there. Of course, there's some uh, problems uh, and challenges, but overall, it's uh, pretty easy to install a few cameras in a barn and in a non-invasive invasive way. And with a single camera, you can monitor multiple animals at a time. And in the case of crops, you can monitor a big area of um, feud of crop feud at a time and not only that if you compare that to other types of sensors like wearable sensors or some very specific uh, temperature or weather sensors uh, images can be more informative in the sense that it not only uh, not only captures the specific trade that you are looking for such as for example if an animal is grazing or not but it can capture other things that are happening in the scene, such as the current weather, the quality of the pasture, uh, the current season, and, and social interactions between animals. You, you can track a lot of things with just an image as compared to specific sensors that only monitor one or a few variables. And with that, computer vision has a huge potential for being used for high throughput phenotyping. And uh, I know uh, a lot of you are geneticists, so you are already familiar with this term, but basically high throughput phenotyping means that you can, um, if you can automatically capture phenotype or basically just uh, information and data from the animals or from the cop, you can use that uh, large scale information for genetic selection. And uh, we know that nowadays, one of the main bottlenecks for improving genetic selection is having this phenotypic data available. So computer vision has a huge potential of facilitating that and improving genetic selection even further. And on top of that, um, computer vision tools can also be used to guide better farm management decisions. And that can benefit the industry as a whole and improve farm efficiency and so on. So it, it not only helps in the technical genetic improvement side, but also in farm management as a, a, role, a whole. So um, as I mentioned before, I'd like to give some uh, basics, intuitions of how computer vision works today. So, the main a core task in computer vision is called image classification. So what the name can tell, um, you have a bunch of images and you want the computer to tell you what's in that image. And what I mean by that is that, for example, this image of a cow, you want the computer to automatically tell you, okay, there's a cow in this image or there's a horse in this image, a dog and so on and so forth. But how can the computer do that? How is this image 
represented inside the computer. So basically, uh, we can think of a scene of, that's just a real world environment, and then you have this system that captures uh, lightning information from the scene. And the system is basically a camera, for example. So the camera has light sensors that capture um, reflections coming from the objects in the scene and quantize those into a grid of pixel intensities. And those pixel intensities are related to how much light is coming into the camera sensors. Um, you can think of that as just a matrix of numbers. So each pixel is a number which represents the intensity of the light that is coming into the particular uh, part of the camera sensor. Um, this is a broad simplification. In reality, images actually have three channels because cameras have color filters to separate different spectrums of light so that images are actually three, colored images are actually three um, matrices of numbers. But for uh, all purposes now for simplification, we've got back to the uh, a single matrix, which is a black and white uh, image. And so we have this matrix and you want the computer to tell us what's in that image, right? So what is that matrix of numbers? So we need a function somehow to convert this matrix of numbers into a final class, a final output. So what would that function look like? Um, I'm gonna talk about some previous attempts using machine learning to solve that problem. So as I mentioned before, an image can be seen as just a matrix of numbers and something we can do, which is very simple, a uh, very naive method we could do it is just flatten those um, rows of numbers into and concatenate them into a single vector of numbers in a one dimension instead of working in two dimensions. And you do that for every row of the image, you're gonna have this huge vector of numbers. And the benefit of doing that is that we could train a linear classifier to tell us what class that array of numbers most likely belong to. And if you're not familiar with uh, like this machine learning lingo, basically uh, the way to train a, li a linear classifier is that uh, you have multiple images that you give as an example for the classifier and it automatically learns um, how to classify new examples. So here in our case, the training data could be uh, multiple images and each image again is represented by this array of numbers and they have a corresponding class that um, it, it represents the object that's inside that, that image. So you, we could, th could think in this case as each pixel being a different predictor and then our response variable being the class that we want to know um, represents the object that's in the image. So if you think about the simple case of linear regression, it's simply um, our response variable equals a linear combination of all the pixels in the image. And then our goal is to find the set of those weights that multiply each pixel value that best fits our training data. So it seems like the main uh, challenge here is how to optimally convert an image to this list of values, which in computer vision lingo is called features. So as we've seen before, the most naive way to do it, that is to flatten the pixel value. So we straight up use all the pixel values the way they come from the image and then use that to train a classifier. But the problem with that is that those images are usually very high dimensional. So if you think of a low resolution image that's only 256 by 256 pixels, that's already 65,000 features that you're gonna use to train a classifier. And if you ever worked with machine learning, you know that machine learning algorithms usually don't work very well with very high dimensional data. And on top of that, those pixel features could be very noisy because every single picture of the image is gonna be considered in the final classifier. And maybe some pixels of the image has nothing to do with the object that you're interested in. Uh, if you look at this image from the cow, there's pixels from grass, from the background, from trees that have nothing to do with the cow and still they're gonna be used to evaluate uh, in the classifier. And finally, an, another, uh, this is a more technical term, but using the straight pixel values 
um, is a technique that's not translation invariant. And that basically means that um, if you change the position of an object within the image, it's going to change the final prediction because you're going to have different weights in your linear model being multiplied by different pixel values if you move an object a little bit. So pixels that um, used to belong to the cow are now in a different position being multiplied by different weights, and that's going to lead to a different classification. But that's not what you want, right? You want, independently of where a cow is in the image, you still want the algorithm to say that's a cow, independently of where the cow is. So. Another way you could do that is to, uh, as if you remember, uh, an image is just three matrices of values for the case of colored images, and you could calculate histograms for each of those channels or each of those matrices. And then the idea here is that different images are going to have different profiles for that histo for those histograms, and then the classifier can use that to classify an image based on the profile of the this, this intensity frequencies uh, within each channel. A similar method that's uh, a little more uh, complicated is to use what's called histogram of gradient. So for each pixel, you calculate the difference between that pixel and its neighbors, and that difference is called the gradient. And you can call, uh, calculate both a magnitude for the difference and a direction for the difference. And then with those uh, values, you can again calculate histograms and then use those frequency, value, frequency values for each bin of your histogram as features for a final uh, classifier. And finally, a very, uh, I'd like to introduce you to a very commonly used uh, technique for image processing, which is applying filters to images. And this uses an operator called a convolution, which is the core of, as you can tell by the name, convolution in your networks. So convolutions, basically, uh, you have your original image, and then you have a, what is called a filter mask. And that filter mask can have different names. Uh, in the deep learning community, it's usually called kernels, convolution kernels. But um, they're basically the same thing. So basically, you have a mask, which is a smaller matrix of numbers. And then you apply a convolution on the image. And a convolution is basically a um, element-wise multiplication of all the pixels that are in the neighborhood of the pixel you're currently multiplying. And then you do a sliding window with the filter mask on all the pic uh, pixels of the image. So you basically uh, multiply this uh, filter mask to all the pixels in the neighborhood of the pixels you're looking at. And then the final result um, of the um, in the output image for that pixel is going to be a linear combination of the neighbors. And then you do that for each pixel in your image, and you're going to have a transformed version of your original image. And it's important to note here that the same filter mask is going to be applied for every single pixel. So uh, here in this case, you would only have nine parameters for the whole image instead of having one weight for each of the individual pixels in the image. And that reduces uh, computational costs a lot. And the rationale behind that is that you can choose different values for this filter mask. And depending on what that matrix looks like, that filter mask, mask matrix look like, you're going to perform different operations on the image. So for example, you can apply a blurring filter, or you can apply an edge detection filter. And those filters are going to extract, extract different types of information from your original image. And that concept is really important to understand how convolution neural networks work. But the question is, how are we supposed to engineer all those values that are inside this filter mask to uh, kind of know what types of information we need to get from the image? So the answer is that you don't necessarily need to do that. That's how we used to do it. But now with uh, convolutional neural networks, we know that we can learn the best values for those filters, the best values for those filter masks. So again, you have an input image. You apply convolution kernels or filter masks to those images. And you come up with transformed versions of those images, which in the deep learning community, it's called feature maps. And then if you have n convolutional kernels being applied in parallel to the image, you are going to have n output feature maps. 
And then if you apply a global average operation, which is basically averaging, averaging all the values in the individual cells of the feature map, so we're going to have one single average value for each feature map, you're going to come up with a feature vector with dimension n. So each individual feature map is going to turn into a single number, and that number is going to be one of your features. So you reduce the dimensionality of your feature space a lot by doing that and you still extract important information from the image. So, but this is still not exactly what convolutional neural networks are. This can be seen as just a single layer of a convolutional neural network. But convolutional neural networks are basically just combinations of sequentially multiple layers of those convolutions. So in the idea here is that each layer is gonna extract different levels of details from your image so that Earlier layers can extract more general information, like the presence of corners, edges, lines, and so on. And as you go to subsequent layers and deeper into the network, those layers are going to start learning and extracting more detailed information and more detailed patterns from your image that are more specific for your task. So to give an example here, we could have, for example, in this first layer that is applied to a 3D image of a cow. This is just an example I had in my research. And you can see the highlighted areas here are the areas where the specific uh, layer found the pattern that each kernel inside the layer is looking for. So for example, one kernel could be looking at uh, edges that are a little curved. Another one could be looking more at like circles and corners. And then subsequent layers are going to use those extracted patterns from previous layers and apply more convolutions to them to extract more rich patterns and information from the image. And then as you go deeper, you're going to have more sparse highlights, which means that those are more specific patterns that are going to, that the network is looking at uh, that are going to help you classify the image in the end. So an example of a cat, for example, you could have that in the last layer, um, a certain filter recognizes pointy ears, another one recognizes whiskers or eyes. And then if you apply the global average operator, each um, feature map, which is already a little, uh, it's already lower dimensional here, you just apply a global average to it, you're gonna come up with one single value for each feature map, and you could think of that value as the presence of a certain characteristic that each kernel is looking at. So for example, one value here could be for uh, cat classification, it could be the presence of pointy ears, whiskers, a fluffy tail, and so on. And then you would have your final class being uh, given by the algorithm. And all those kernels, again, just to reinforce that, are learned automatically by this network based on your training data. So instead of having to think about what values I should use for each single kernel or each single filter mask in my convolutions, I can have the network learn that automatically. So that can be thought of as a automatic feature extraction technique instead of relying on something like a pixel histogram and performing those feature engineering to come up with your features. But the caveats of using convolutional neural networks is that they can get very complex and very big. And that's where its power comes from, its power of generalizing and learning a diverse set of pattern, um, learning a diverse set of patterns and being able to recognize things in images, that's a very complex test. So they have to be complex as well. So you can have, th th this is just a small list of the most popular, some of the most popular uh, convolutional neural network architectures. And you can see that some of them have hundreds of millions of parameters. And in order to train those, you can guess you're going to need a lot of computational resources. And if you, I'd like to bring attention to those last two columns. So you have the time span per inference step. Inference step is basically just running a prediction on an image. So the time span per inference step on a CPU can be up to 20 times slower than the time per inference step on a GPU. And this is for inference, but we also have a graph for training. So training is, it gets even worse. So in order to train a convolutional neural network, it would take 
approximately 70 times more time to train using a CPU than using a GPU. And GPUs, as many of you know, are expensive. Uh, they are very uh, in demand right now. They are used for gaming, training neural networks, even Bitcoin mining. And they are an expensive hardware that not everyone has access to. But let's assume that you have a GPU at home, you're a gamer or a miner, you have a GPU at home, or you are part of, you're affiliated to a new university and you're lucky enough to have access to a cluster of servers that have GPUs and you wanna use all that computing power to train your own neural network. So what can we do? Today, there's a, a lot of frameworks available that really facilitate that for programmers. So uh, frameworks such as PyTorch, TensorFlow, and Keras make it much easier for programmers to implement their own neural network without having to implement all the code for the convolution operations for backpropagation, which is how uh, those weights are updated, or for stochastic gradient descent, which is the optimization method used for training those networks. You don't need to implement any of that by hand because those frameworks already have that implemented and you basically just call uh, functions from these frameworks to do it for you. So you can define in a single line of code that you want a certain convolutional layer with certain parameters and that you want to train. So this very last line of code here does all the training for you in a single line of code. So it facilitates a lot your life, but you still have to design your own architecture here. Um, but there's also a solution for that. Today, there's many GitHub repositories containing state-of-the-art architectures already implemented. So it's a very common practice in computer vision today that every time you publish a paper proposing a new architecture, you also release the code in a GitHub repository for free. And it's an open source code and it's great. You can use it. Um, it follows the FAIR principle. So it's findable. It's really easy to find. It's usually just linked inside of the paper. It's easily accessible. You just need, you, sometimes you don't even need a GitHub account. You just call the repository and use it. It's inter interoperable, um, meaning that you can use it in different platforms and operation systems, and it's reproducible. So they do that so that you can reproduce the experiments performed in the paper uh, the way you want. And not only that, you can also adapt those network architectures and that code for training those uh, uh, algorithms to your own problem and to your own data set. So this is all great, but this is all assuming you have some coding experience, right? Because you are still going to need to adapt the code somehow to your specific data set. The data sets that are used in uh, computer vision research are very like standard data sets and they're curated already. They're clean. They follow a certain format. So if you want to use your own data set and use your own task, you're going to need to tweak the code a little bit. And also, if you want to uh, come up with your own architecture, instead of using off the shelf architectures, maybe for a problem, you work better to implement your own architecture, then you're definitely going to need some programming experience, even with those frameworks that facilitate things or still need some experience. And most importantly, you need debugging capacity. So you need to deal with errors. And um, if any of you have had experience, trying to implement uh, some of those uh, some of those neural networks by yourself and installing Python for the first time and installing all the necessary packages. You know what I mean when I say that every single step seems like there's an error. So you try to install Python, you'll get an error. You try to install the driver for the GPU, you'll get an error. And then you start TensorFlow, you'll get an error. And then you solve that and then you get another error because it's incompatible with your Python version. And then it's on Keras, it's incompatible with your GPU version. And then you get another error and another error, and then you're crazy and you wanna punch the computer and not wanna do anything with neural networks anymore. It can get very frustrating. And I know uh, from experience uh, working with people who had never installed a Python environment before, trying to play around with neural networks for the first time and installing those repositories, it can get very frustrating and very overwhelmed. So the consequence of that, of course, is that there's clearly a somewhat high barrier for new users. So 
those frameworks and those um, repositories are very friendly for expert users and for people who have some experience coding, where someone who doesn't even know what Python is, it can get very hard to figure out how to set up everything just to run a single line of code that works without an error. And that can delay the development of computer vision tools for agriculture for other areas as well, but here you're interested in agriculture. And then it gets to the point that maybe some great ideas are never implemented. So not always bad, there's light in the end of the tunnel, there's some really great democratization initiatives out there. And I'd like to highlight just a couple of them, for example, uh, but I really like uh, this tool called Teachable Machine from Google. Uh, I really encourage you all to uh, play around with it later after this workshop. And it's a free to use tool. It's very user friendly. It's very easy to use. And it's focused on educational purposes. So it, it has some limitations. Like, for example, you can't customize your network that much. You can just choose whatever architecture you want. And you can only run predictions and inference on one image at a time. So it's not really suitable for research. There's this kind of like trade off between being very simple to use and being focused on educational purposes and some, some tool that it can actually be used for research because it doesn't, it's hard to validate, um, to run predictions on a validation set and validate your model if you can only run inference on one image at a time, for example. And another tool I'd like to highlight is Custom Vision by Microsoft. And I know there's other tools that are similar to this one from Amazon and, but I'd like to highlight Custom Vision because I've worked with that before and it's very easy to use, highly customizable. Uh, it calculates validation metrics for you so you can validate your model and see how well it's doing. But the problem with that is that those tools, um, you have to pay to use their service. So that's why finally we came up with this idea of developing this tool that we call Train Your Network. So our, our vision with that tool is that it has to be a free to use tool. It's designed completely for non-experts. So we, it's supposed to be very simple. You don't require any coding experience. And it's not going to be frustrating for you to use if you don't have coding experience. So that's our main goal. And then also um, talking about hardware availability, um, the idea is that those tools are going to be connected. Th this tool is going to be connected to GPU servers. So GPU resources are going to be available for the users uh, without cost and they can train it. Um, and also thinking about research and commercial applications, we want the two to be able to run inference on multiple images at a time and calculate performance metrics so we can evaluate how well our trained model is doing. And with that, before I dive into the demo, I'd like to give a quick interview of the flow that a, a user will find when trying to use the tool. So first of all, if you want to train your own network, first thing you're going to do is upload your images. And here is specifically training and validation images. And then the network is going to be trained. And here I'd like to highlight again that it's going to be running on a GPU server. And after the network is done training, you're going to be able to visualize the results and the performance metrics of the training procedure. And you're going to be able to save your final model and run inference. And on the inference part of the tool, you're going to be able to either use the model that you just trained, you go straight from the uh, training results to the inference page, or you can choose a pre-trained model or a model that you already have on your computer. And after you select the model that you want to use, you upload your testing images, so the images that you want to run new predictions on. And here, of course, there are going to be images that are different from your training set to evaluate how well the network can uh, generalize to different images. It's going to run inference, again, on a GPU server, and then you're going to be able to visualize the predictions on those images. So if with that, I'd like to invite you for a quick demo. I'm going to open the tool here in my computer and share the screen with you. And um, I just like, uh, like to highlight that if you have any questions, feel free to type on the chat. 
Uh, there's going to be a time in the middle of the demo that I'm going to uh, train the network and I'm going to take a few minutes. So I'm going to have time available to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, but for now, let me stop sharing this presentation. And thanks so much for your attention. I'm going to dive uh, right away to the demo. All right, so I just like to make sure everyone is looking at the right screen. If you can give a yes on the chat or something. Um, uh, let me see if I should. All right, okay, so I got at least one yes. Yeah, so, okay. All right, All right so let's get started. So. Um, as I said, you have two options in this tool for now. You can train or run inference on an image classification neural network. And we have those other options here for image segmentation and object detection. Uh, Dr. Dory is going to talk more about that later when he talk about the feature steps for this tool. Uh, but for now, let's train a model for image classification. So let's just hit text. And then we want to select the number of classes we have. So for this quick demo, I prepared a data set of cow behavior. So I have a bunch of images of cows lying down, uh, eating, or just walking around uh, the barn. So I want to have three different classes. And then the first class I'm going to call lying. Um, you can type whatever you want. Then another class would be cows walking and then cows eating. After I type the names, uh, it's going to ask me to upload the images. So here you have a training data set and a test data set. And this test data set is basically what's also called in machine learning a validation set. So it's a set that's not going to be used for training, but it's going to be used to calculate accuracies through all the neural network training. And it's usually good practice to have a separate uh, test set separate from those two to finally evaluate your final performance of your model. And the reason for that is that you usually train multiple neural networks, right? You don't just train a single one and call it a day and say, this is the best I can get. You usually play around with hyperparameters. You try different architectures. You try different processing methods for your images. So you're going to have a lot of different architectures or different trained models. And then you want to evaluate the performance on a validation set and choose the best model for that validation set. But if you just report that value, I know it might be boring saying that for uh, machine learning practitioners right here, but just to highlight that, if you uh, report the performance on that validation set that you already chose the best network for, it's going to be um, overestimated. So it's always good practice to have a third testing set to finally evaluate your neural network. So here it just, okay, we have a training set and a validation set. So I'm going to choose for each class, um, I'm going to choose the training images that I want for them. So I'm just going to select it all. I had it all uh, prepared here before, but it's basically just selecting which images you want to be part of each class. Um, so now for the validation set, I had line. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see my window prompt, but it doesn't matter. I'm just selecting the images uh, from my computer. That way, right. so we can we can see you can okay yes, that's okay fine. thanks, Sean. Yeah. So after you selected all the um, images corresponding to all the classes, you can hit next again. And it's going to load a little bit because it's uploading the images to your server. And um, let me, yeah, it's loading here. It's OK. So it's done uploading. Now we can start training. And on this screen, this is the screen that takes, it's going to take a few minutes. Um, so um, I, I'd like to just quickly run through what's going on here. You have this log, which basically outputs some information about the network. So it shows for each epoch. And epoch is basically a term for each run through your whole training set. So the neural network um, sees the training images multiple times during training. And an epoch is 
a full run through your whole training set. So usually one multiple runs through your training set to update your model, your weight values. And that's what an epoch is. So in a, after each epoch, it outputs the accuracy on the training set and the accuracy on the validation set that you uh, we uploaded. Here, the accuracies are very high, very close to 95, 96%. And this is basically because this is just a toy example. It's overall pretty easy to tell like whether a cow is lying down or like eating. There's some, um, get, like you can see the image of a gate before the cow. So this data set is not uh, that challenging. So, um, but you, you can see, I mean, uh, it's not that challenging for that kind of model. So you can see that she's uh, very high uh, accuracy very quickly during the training procedure. And here, it's going to still take a few minutes, so I'd like to invite you to fill a poll again. Um, so I'm going to have the poll questions up. Yeah, so it should be up now. And I, again, give a few seconds for you to, to answer the, the questions and let me know if you have any trouble um, filling up those answers. Okay, so I, I, I keep the poll up, um, but I see a, a question in the chat. So are you running it on your GPU or server cluster somewhere? And in case it's a cluster, how do you connect the app to the server cluster? So this is currently working on some servers we have at, um, at, at Azure. And the idea in the future is to plug that into the server cluster in the university. So for now, we are uh, hosting it in our own GPU server. And basically the website is hosted in that same server that has a GPU and everything is being run in the server. Uh, but yeah, as Ron is gonna mention, the idea is to connect that into the cluster that's available in the university in the future. And that's what you, that's gonna be uh, the standard for, uh, for performing those operations for this tool. Uh, but for now it's running in one of our own servers. All right, so it seems like it's done training. Um, I can close the poll here. I see a lot of uh, most most people answered already. Okay, so now in, in the screen we can see the performance of the model per class. So it gives a precision and a recall uh, metric, and precision is basically how many of the images that the model thought belonged to a certain class actually belong to the certain class. So here, for example, 99% of the images that the model thought uh, there were images of a cow eating were actually images of a cow eating. And then recall is how many of the actual images, the ground truth images of a cow uh, eating, um, the model predicted correctly. So here in this case, it's 98%. Um, and this uh, is just a bar chart of those same values. You can visualize it a little better. Um, and it also shows you how many images were used. And, and here, if you have an unbalanced data set, you would usually see here very clearly that you have less images for certain classes, and those classes are probably going to have worse performance. But here, it's all balanced. It's all uh, pretty nice. So I got similar performance for every class. and the Important thing here is that you have those two buttons on the top where you can download the model and it's going to download this H5 file 
Uh, and this file you can use to run inference later. So as I'm going to show you the two kind of flows you can use to run inference um, using a, a trained model. So here I'm going to save the model in my computer and it sends me right to the inference page with the model that I just trained. So here I don't need to uh, choose a model anymore. I can just choose the images that I want to test on. So I'm going to go right away and select my testing images. It's going to use the model that I just trained. Here are some information about that trained model. And if I click next, it's gonna it's running inference on those images and it's gonna show me the predictions. So for each image here, it tells me what class the model thinks it belongs to and the confidence uh, level, the probability that the model thinks that image belongs to that class. So here you can see a lot of cows eating, it gets it right. Um, if I scroll down, yeah, here there's some cows lying, it also gets right, different very high confidence level. So it looks like the model uh, was trained pretty well. And yeah, here are some other examples of cow just walking around. And um, this is a slightly more challenging um, task, but you can see that the model still uh, performed pretty well. Some of them, like this one here, that cow is actually uh, with their Head in the headlock and it predicted wrongly as walking, but with a low confidence. So it means that the model was not that certain that the the cow was actually walking, but it it was still the highest probability, but was still not very certain. But anyway, uh, this is the final output uh, when you upload your testing set for a model. And then I'd like to quickly go back to the initial page. So here is the flow after you train a model, run inference on that same model. But it's also possible uh, to go back to the main page, select inference here, and it's going to ask you to load your own custom model and the images. So if I want to load my own custom model, I can select the model that I just downloaded, this H5 file, which basically contains the trained model parameter values, which are basically, uh, if you remember from, uh, from convolutions, it's basically the kernel the filter masks values um, all from the whole network. So I can go on, select this model. I'm gonna, again, select some um, images. Uh, let me go back because it sent me to a different place. Okay, so I'm gonna select some testing images again, and then it's gonna do the same thing with this model that I just uploaded. It's gonna give me um, a confidence level and a class, a predicted class for each of the images that I have uploaded. So it's running the predictions now. Hopefully it's gonna be up in a few seconds. Yeah, so there you go. It's the same model, so it's gonna be exactly the same results that I just showed. Um, and that's basically it for now. That's how the tool is on the current stage. And I'm gonna give um give room for Juan to talk about some of her next steps but before that uh, i think i'm gonna run yet another poll and i'm sorry about that but it really helps us when you answer those questions but before giving the presentation to Juan, i'm gonna quickly uh run launch a poll here and while Juan sets everything up and is ready for his presentation Juan's gonna talk about some more um, next steps that we envision for this tool. And thank you very much for the attention of everyone. Thank you very much, Rafael. Uh, great presentation, very clear. Thanks, thanks for, for introducing this tool. Um, let me know when you want me to go. Maybe you still I need a few minutes or seconds to, to get your answers here. Yeah, I'm gonna wait for yeah a little bit more for the for people to fill up the poll. Uh, there's a question in the chat. So is there any pipeline available for segmentation? That's a great question. 
And that's something uh, Joao is going to talk about. Um, there's not currently in the tool that available, just to give a kind of a spoiler, that's not currently available in our tool, but we definitely plan to uh, implement that in the future. And there are some challenges related to how to annotate that data in the tool and so on that are going to want to have like some feedback on more people and more researchers. But the simple question is that it's not currently available, but we definitely plan to to implement that in the in the near future. OK, um, how is that? Uh, can I move forward, uh, I guess? Yeah, I think you can. You can move forward. OK, sounds good. So I uh, won't take long here. I think Rafael uh, did an amazing job presenting the network. So it's a so what I, I present now. Um, Actually, we will answer some of these questions related to what we can do, what we plan to do in the future. Uh, and so I'll show you a few slides about the future directions, what you want to get with that. Okay. So uh, again, we want to acknowledge it's UPI uh, for funding this initiative. That was uh, one of the first rounds of seed grant uh, program. Um, now the rounds are larger, the amount of, of fund that um, someone can get applying, it's much larger than we get before, but it was enough for us to get started and, and show uh, the potential of the tool. So um, when we get this grant, we plan to develop the tool for image classification only, that what would be possible to promote the idea and to uh, um, you know, um, force a more discussion around uh, this type of, of uh, tool. And so what do we wanna, do now um, it's uh, equip more the tool, develop more and and move forward developing and, and um, disseminating the tool for other people uh, to use. okay So right now, as Rafael mentioned, we are using that uh, image classification and we are training only one architecture. And that, that architecture is exception uh, for image classification. But one of the goals uh, moving forward is to have multiple architecture for image classification uh, being trained in parallel. Okay, so at the end of training process, uh, we would have not only precision recall, F1 score, accuracy, whatever metric we are using to evaluate the quality of the prediction, but also we would have that by uh, models and and some people may be interested in small networks that could fit in a mobile phone and some other people doesn't matter they would they would use a network with millions of parameters and that would, wouldn't be a problem and so our idea now is to parallelize training process uh, and so we would be able to display a leaderboard with the architecture and how they perform for that specific task that someone um, it's interest, okay? So that's one one item that we uh, are working and we, wanna, we plan to develop and implement this tool, okay? So the second one, uh, it's related to the computer vision tasks, as I guess uh, someone asked about the segmentation and detection. So right now uh, we are on the first uh, example here, image classification, basically you have that image. So we classify this image uh, for, for a given, uh, question that we want to answer. Um, but our plan is to move to uh, segment segmentation and object detection. The reason we didn't do that at the beginning is that we didn't have the infrastructure for development uh, necessary to deliver uh, the results of this city grant in the timeline because it was a short period of time. And to incorporate segment segmentation object detection, we had to deal uh, with uh, image annotation labeling. So how are you gonna draw these polygons and how are you gonna um, annotate and make sure this is standardized and how the image annotation will be embedded uh, in the tool. And so people don't have to export the annotations uh, and, and um, deal with coding to do that, okay? And the same is for object detection. So our idea now, also it, as I said, so the idea of the image classification is that we need we don't uh, we didn't need labels. So basically, when you select the class and you name the class, you automatically uh, label all the image of the folders for that given image. So you have that class. So it's much easier to process in terms of development. And so right now, um, what we want to do it's embed uh, some of these image annotation uh, annotators a tool into the our. Um, web platform so people could annotate the data and instead of exporting JSON files and CSV or text file that would be automatically exported 
and so would be ready to be processed by uh, the back end of the application. Okay, so that's that's another uh, step that we want to do in terms of development. Okay, so to do that, uh, we plan to reach out to some initiatives that have open source tools for labeling. So the labeling tool would be embedded in the train your uh, network uh, tool, and so the the fact that we don't have to import these files would make uh, life much easier, especially if we keep if we continue to think about uh, no experts or people that don't have uh, the ability to uh, export the JSON files or put that to read. So this would be a barrier if we implement as it is now. So that's why the need of uh, merging uh, the, the, the labeling tool with the training process. Another thing we want to do, we're not doing right now, uh, is to create an advanced version. So uh, some of you will probably ask, okay, um, I want to change the number of epochs. I want to change batch size. I want to define other criteria for early stopping. I don't want to run k food cross-validation as I'm trained. I want to run different thing. I want to change learning rate. I want to change optimization method uh, that I'm using for training. And so right now, that's not possible. That now this is all locked. Um, in one side, it limits can limit you a lot from what you can do and how you can train uh, the network. Uh, but the other hand, we try to protect uh, some of these, uh, some of you that never used this before in terms of setting some automation behind the scenes that would uh, um, facilitate training process, for example. And so um, right now, for example, the number of epochs, I've mentioned that is super, it's high, but then we have our early stopping tool that say, okay, if uh, accuracy of validation laws, uh, validation laws doesn't decrease anymore for X amount of epochs, we stop training, right? So right now, that's how it's running. But we plan to have a version that if you click advanced, then you would be able to uh, set these features and uh, set these parameters and and search uh, what um, how you train a model like that. So now, if we have that possibility of having uh, you can change learning rate or number of epochs and things like that, uh, we would probably have to have a tuning data set. So then you'd have now not only training data sets and testing data sets, but then you possibly would need to use a tuning uh, to, to tune some of these hyperparameters, uh, like learning rate, for example. Okay. Um, so for that, you cannot exactly be an expert. You need to understand uh, how this works to use. So, but we, we do believe that some people that they know how it works. Sometimes they just want to give a shot to say, okay, let me train pretty quick here. I don't want to spend a bunch of time submitting jobs. Let me see how it performs. And say, I'm going to save time just doing this. And then if it performs well or not well, I guess this will you quickly indicate, uh, okay, that's the modification you should do. And then someone can basically do the coding part and writing the whole thing. But I guess for advanced people, this would give like a quick shot about what you were able to find with that uh, as it is or setting those parameters very simple and uh, very quick. Not saying that would be the final way to get your model trained, but it could be a starting point just to point some direction uh, given the model you have. Okay. And uh, another important point here, it's a collaboration. Uh, we need to work in collaboration with different um, groups. Uh, we, one of them uh, we are talking here is Center for High Throughput Computing. I guess the High Throughput Computing servers or centers in different educational institutions, uh, they are some sort of target for us in terms of, okay, how can we plug this as an app or as, to use the back end in terms of your GPU so students uh, could use, researchers at the university could use. And so the tool is basically uh, the interface that you facilitate uh, things for lectures and classes and, and maybe for research or maybe for a final project of a course uh, or maybe for a small research project and so on. The point is um, it's hard to sustain these if there is no through collaboration with centers, data, cent the, uh, uh, data centers that we have hardware uh, to, to provide for that type of work. Uh, it's, it's impossible to keep this in the cloud forever. Someone has to pay for the, the hardware infrastructure. And so um, I guess it's a very interesting way to leverage uh, the high school computing center different institutions because a much broader audience will use that. They would never submit a job for high school computing. They may use high school computing indirectly 
and leverage the hard infrastructure just because they have an interface to play with. So that's uh, that's a thought process. Uh, and another goes to a cybers uh, with Eric. Uh, it would be great to work with in collaboration with him to see how can implement that front end uh, there and, and leverage the computational resource that cybers uh, has available. Uh, and so that that the type of collaboration we'll be looking for. And so if someone here uh, has um, interest to talk more about that, we'll be I'm more than happy to do so. Okay, uh, there are other initiatives, open source uh, initiatives related to image annotation. Uh, and so that's another uh, group, all the groups that we want to reach out to see how can we embed some of those um, image annotation um, um, platforms that are open, super light some, most of the time uh, into the tools so people can annotate, export in that uh, annotation that's exported can be already consumed by uh, the whole pipeline that we set up uh, in the back end. Okay, and another thing we really want to reach people, including our lab, is probably will be the first uh, to, to promote this because we have some of these models. Is how can we have a library uh, inside this tool that um, we pre-train the models, right? So if I train an uh, object detector that is a cattle detector, you detect a cow or uh, a calf in image, and so if I have this pre-trained network uh, hosted there in the library someone that just want to run inferences in thousands of um, images with cattle, they can just load the cattle detecting run and get their detection. The same to, okay, they want to segment animal body. Um, and so we will try to keep this library for tasks that are um, of common use, let's put this way. So basically uh, someone is interested in a phenotype, they are interested in the body weight, for example, um, this may be very specific, but then if we have an animal body segmenter, uh, then it will be great because people would leverage this for different phenotypes or for different ideas. And so if we can have generic uh, algorithms in a library, it could be for crop, could be for other uh, things. This would be amazing. People could definitely not only leverage the, 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 the models or the algorithm, but they would have that in the right place, which means inference would be much easier and efficient if you have the models and the place to run that specific model, right? And But for that, you need to reach out and, and talk and collaborate with others that they may have a model say, okay, I have these, I'm about to publish, or I already published these. Um, but if you want to put in a library, you know, here you go, it can detect crop disease or can segment a leaf um, of corn or can count grains or kernels, or I don't know. It could be any of these applications, I guess. Uh, having this in a library would make uh, the tool even, even more interesting, okay. Um, and, and we could maybe would, uh, leave that open to, to others to suggest about a specific tool they may have. The problem here is these tools will possibly need to, to run um, on, uh, should basically be model trains in some of the models that we are training. Uh, in the network at that given time, because then otherwise people will just load different algorithms and we won't have the backend infrastructure to read and make inference, okay? Uh, and now those are uh, the ideas and the plans that we have in terms of future directions, I guess. We build you know, uh, the framework, uh, we learn a lot putting this together and what the limitations are and what the opportunities are. So I guess now it's more uh, of talking to people and collaborating and make sure the tweets evolving for, for common interest, right? For, for open source and open use. Um, I guess that's that's the real goal here. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, that's the uh, Instagram and Twitter of, of our group. Uh, Tiago Brizolin, he is assistant professor um, in Illinois, uh, University of Illinois, uh, Urbana right now. And um, I guess, I don't know what, oh, okay. Um, and um, he is a great co-PI collaborating in this project too. He was here before, so now he's in Illinois. So we have a great pleasure to collaborate with him. He's online. He can definitely uh, answer questions for you as well. And how far is here? So now we will be open for questions and discussions uh, that you all may have. I think that that's what I I want to show in terms of future directions. Okay. Okay, I think there is a question here from about 15 minutes ago. Is that, oh, that's the segmentation question that um, Rafael mentioned. So um, 
Any question, any comment uh, from you all? I guess I, wa I wanna ask you a question. I guess that's, I have a question to ask you and it's only one question. Oh, two questions, I'm sorry. Um, oh, oh no, I think I've already ran this. Yeah. You mean the the poll? Yeah, the last poll um, were before your- Yeah, your right, yeah. So yeah. I think I, I, we have no question at this point. I guess, um, yeah, those are, we answer, we, we, we ask all of those. Okay, so any any questions, any, any comments? Okay, there is a question here saying, is the tool available to the public? Okay, so we're gonna leave the tool available. We're gonna share the link with you all so you can launch, train a model. So we're gonna leave the tool available uh, for probably 24 hours after, after uh, that workshop. And the reason is we are in process of moving the tool from a specific survey to the other. And so right now um, we cannot leave that open um, uh, forever, right? So we need to make sure this is hosted by a specific server that would be uh, completely free. So you will be able to use, uh, but at this point is is limited the amount of time you're gonna have, uh, you'll be able to use. And and the reason is we are still finishing uh, some of these uh, implementations and servers um, that whether it will be running. So uh, there is another question. Does Wisconsin University offer workshop or training person for grad students from other universities? So I'm, I'm not sure um, which type of workshop or training uh, for in-person. So maybe you wanna specify that more. Um, well, there are, there are workshops and course um, happening here. Uh, I guess the Data Science Institute here, uh, they organize a lot of those um, data related workshops. And if, if you go to the website, uh, Data Science Institute, I can, I can place here, uh, they they do have some workshops um, and some of them are in person too. Um, that is another question. How about video files? Can you use them to train them? We don't have that capability. Uh, not yet. Yeah, that's a good point. Right now, only images. Any open source annotation tool available? Well, there are, uh, I think, several. Um, uh, options, I guess, via yeah. image annotator, uh, it's one. I think you just shared the. Yeah, I just yeah, I, sh I just shared the link for the tool that yeah. you use the most here. It's and there are we, we use most uh, VGG, and then there are uh, label me. I, I I don't don't know the num the name of all of them, um, but there are uh, a few um, that you can use. Um, Okay, no, that's that's a good point here about the image segmentation. So Nicole, um, she it's a great source to uh, communicate with with you about uh, the results of the seed grants or possible new grants from AD2 API. So as we continue to develop that, I guess uh, we definitely, as we develop the object detection segmentation, we will make sure uh, Nicole is aware, and so Nicole can send. Uh, for the list today, and then maybe more, right? So the whole network that the AD2PI created over these years uh, to disseminate the result, absolutely. That would be from uh, high priority and uh, from our interest too. Uh, there is a, a, an excellent question here. What do you happen if 40 students use the platform at the same time, okay? So that's some of the backend work we are, uh, developing and talking to Center for High Throughput Computing. And that's some of the infrastructure that we need to develop at this point, right? So how many GPUs are gonna use, how are gonna organize the jobs, how much are gonna parallelize them and so on and so forth. So there is a lot to be developed in the back end to, to disseminate that uh, in large scale. So for hundreds of people to use at the same time, and there is a cost associated with that too, okay? So, um, that's part of our development. So that's why we are talking to high to computer centers. That's the only way. Otherwise you cannot fund or support from by our own uh, uh, infrastructure, computational infrastructure to, to make 
GPUs available so forty students would run individually at the same time. Okay, there are uh, there is some infrastructure in terms of development on how to parallelize and make the process efficient. But at the same time, you need hardware uh, to do that. Okay, yeah. So right now, as it is, uh, we do, we are not capable of doing this. So that's part of what we are developing. Right now, we use few GPUs, and so if you load with hundred jobs at the same time, uh, we use the whole memory, and and then we'll be able to train. Um, thank you for the workshop. Okay. Um, excellent. Very good question. So what else? Um, Tiago, do you have any comment? I have something we forgot to, to mention. Yeah. One thing I'd like to, to ask if I should, um, put the link for the tool here on the chat or it's, if it's going to be sent to the viewers later in the email or something. Uh, what I guess, should be the best way to yeah, do? that's a good question for Nicole. Uh, Nicole, do you, do, you, do you feel you should uh, send an email with the link later or uh, post here or both? Um, we can do we can do both. That's fine. Um, I'm happy to send an email um, to to everyone who registered uh, with the final survey that you have. Okay. All right. And just for yeah, I just send the link here too, so you can get started. But yeah, uh, that last question was very pertinent. Uh, now, since you currently have limited the number of GPUs on the server that's running, uh, there might be some, some errors if dozens of people try to train at the same time using that link currently. And that's also another reason why uh, we are just planning to leave it open for 24 hours to uh, see what the tool's usage looks like and so, so that you, can try it for yourself as well. So the idea was that right after the workshop, you can try to use the tool for yourself. Um, and that's why you're just gonna leave it open for, for a short period of time. Uh, but keep in mind that there might be issues related to the GPU memory, unfortunately, for now. Yeah, Rafael, there is a, another great comment here or a question saying, um, is it possible to conduct this kind of workshop at every stage of the development? That this would be ideal, for absolutely. Um, that will be uh, amazing, and I think A2PI it's um, is is a perfect source to help us organizing and, and disseminating that um, that type of um, training and, and information. Yeah. Anybody? Anybody else? Okay, I don't see any other uh, question um, here, Nicole. I don't know if you um, if you if you if you have any announcement or wanna um, anything to to put in here. No, I don't have any other announcements. Um, but if um, there's anyone who maybe just wants to unmute and ask a question, um, I think the group's small enough that that would be okay to do um, if you're not able to enter a question in the chat or if you're just more comfortable asking. Okay. Yeah, Eric, it would be great to talk to you. Um, we definitely have, we have huge interest on, on collaborating with Cyverse and, and, and put this at the cloud level um, with you guys. Rafael, do you want to address, uh, there is a question here. Um, if you want to address that, maybe it's an option to use this, the link Rafael sent, and maybe if you have the image, you can try, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think in this case, uh, if you have different images for different levels of severity, um, I don't know if you're thinking about doing a regression or a classification, but assuming it's the classification, it would have uh, different classes for different severity levels for your images. So it would have examples of healthy leaves and leaves with level one, severity level two, level three, et cetera. I, I don't know exactly how that would be made, but you, the idea is that it would have different images for different levels of the disease severity and those le different levels would be your classes. So you can just use the tool to choose a number of different levels you want to discriminate from and then you upload the images for each of those levels and then training the network 
um, and, and checking what whether it would be able to to evaluate that in new images. So yeah, if, if you're thinking about a classification task, then for sure that could be uh, used for that case. You would just need to have some images ready uh, to use as training data. Maybe do a last call for questions. You can unmute or or throw it in chat. I want to say it looks like it's a good time to to wrap this up. Um, I would like to give a uh, an audible or virtual applause to all of our presenters today. And of course, Nicole, Eddie, and the entire AG2PI team for putting this on. 